A few days before he died, Simon and I spoke for what turned out to be the last time. I was in France, sitting in the sun outside an idyllic chalet after a day's skiing. He was in the hospice where he spent his final days, his affairs in order, waiting for the end. His voice was weak, but instantly recognizable, agreeably high-pitched and faintly camp. He was struggling for breath, but there was no hint of self-pity nor anger at his lot. He told me that James, his father, was concerned about the eulogy at his memorial service and asked me if I would consider delivering it. I pointed out that I'd known him for less than 25 years and that others were far better qualified. Yes, but I think they will find it too difficult. It needs an unsentimental sod like you. <laughs> Having settled that, he said he had recently had a long chat with our two sons and that we should be very proud of them. He reminded me that before we knew each other, he considered buying the house nearest to our own, a mere 200 yards away, down a farm track. I'm quite sure that if I had, neither of us would have made it even this far. His last words to me, before exhaustion finally overcame him, were, ski like a champion, the clearest sign imaginable that his sense of irony and love of teasing remained undefeated. In the event, of course, Simon had bought Carrick House, five miles away from us, so still dangerously close. Catherine's children, Charlotte and Ed, were at school with ours, and they soon shared the school run. I think the first impression Simon made on us may have been how punctual and organized he was. But very early on, it became clear that he was enormous fun, had an unrivaled ear for double entendre, and that we were going to get along fine. Over the next few years, we discovered a lot more about him, not necessarily in the following order. He loved entertaining and was an extraordinarily generous host. He understood perfectly the correct proportions for a gin and tonic and seemed to have an inexhaustible supply of champagne and fine wines. He was a very good cook who consistently overestimated the number of courses his guests were capable of eating. In the wrong light, he might have been mistaken for Gordon Ramsay, but I don't think I ever heard him raise his voice in anger, even in the kitchen. He was devoted to Catherine and shared many of her qualities. They made a wonderful team and enjoyed an unusually harmonious relationship. He was also devoted to Charlotte and Ed and took enormous pains over them. They, in return, had to put up with constant teasing and excruciating questions about their private lives. He loved dogs and was much comforted in his final months by Hector, an elegant animal with exquisite manners. He and his predecessor, Zach, presided over an enormous leather basket near the dining table, where Simon would occasionally join them for a quick nap if his batteries needed recharging during the course of a demanding evening. But no matter how demanding the evening, by the time one came down in the morning, Simon would be hard at work on his computer, washing up done and the house tidy once more. His love of order and harmony extended to the garden, which always looked immaculate. He was notably gregarious and had an unusually wide range of friends from all stages of his life. He was by nature sunny and kind and not at all censorious, but he could be fearlessly outspoken if he thought something was unfair. Simon's organizational abilities were formidable but they didn't always lead to the intended result. One year we were having supper after the children's school sports day and bitching enjoyably about some of the newer parents. Sports days there had traditionally been relaxed and informal, even scruffy, but we had detected a recent tendency to indulge in competitive displays of ostentatious wealth. Bentleys, butlers, enormous hampers, turning up earlier to grab prime spots, that sort of thing. The problem was what to do about it. After due consideration and a few more bottles, we came up with two possible approaches. Either to turn up in our battered old Land Rover with a couple of straw bales to sit on, or to outdo the Aravis in vulgarity so spectacularly that it couldn't be ignored. Either way, they would surely get the message. And that was the last thought any of us gave to the matter, or so we would have imagined. But then a fortnight before the boys' final sports day at the school, Simon called us. Do you remember our conversation last year? 
Well, it's all arranged. Simon had not gone for the old Land Rover and Straw Bell option. I've hired a pink stretched Cadillac, <laughs> and it's picking us all up at 8 a.m. I've decided we should all wear pink too. We arrived at the school playing field to find staff from Worthington waiting by two enormous and very grand gazebos, underneath which was a long dining table with enough glasses on it for a steak banquet. Initially, all went according to plan. One of the first to arrive was the Donish figure on an ancient bicycle. His young daughter perched on the handlebars. She jumped down, stomped over to us, put her hands on her hips, and told us we should all be ashamed of ourselves. When Jeremy Paxman passed it by a bit later, the look he gave us said something similar. Jeremy Clarkson saw us too, and was so impressed that a full two years later, he was able to recall the site, more or less accurately, in his Sunday Times column. Someone arrived at my local prep school sports day in a pinch, pink stretch Hummer. At first, I thought they were being ironic, but the gazebo they then built in the car park suggested they weren't. Honestly, they couldn't have got it more wrong if they'd turned up in split crutch scuba suits. You can imagine how delighted Simon was with that. <laughs> but the truth was that we failed utterly. All day long, the Cadillac rocked on its springs while hordes of delighted children tried out its cocktail cabinet and other attractions. Meanwhile, their parents queued up sheepishly to try and book the chauffeur for subsequent events. And we were reminded, not for the first or last time in Simon's company, that spectacular vulgarity can be a lot of fun. His sense of humour was perfectly attuned to teenagers. On one drive across Cornwall to visit some National Trust house or other, with Ed and our younger son on board, he managed to get ahead of the rest of us. Some minutes later, we came round a corner to find the three of them mooning at us from the side of the road. When we arrived at the house, we were greeted by a youth outreach officer, a tall, genial man with a beard, but no sense of danger. He made a valiant attempt to ingratiate himself with the 11 mutinous teenagers in our party. You're going to love your visit here, girls and boys. We've got lots of wonderful Tudor games for you to play. For instance, have any of you ever heard of Slapcock? Their instant and unanimous response brought tears to Simon's eyes. We never heard much about what Simon had done before we met him, because he was charmingly modest and rarely spoke about himself. The notable exceptions were usually comic or scurrilous or both. So we knew about the contents of the Vaseline pot found in his hotel room in San Francisco, about unusual receptacles for carrying loose change at Cambridge. They truly do things differently there. <laughs> about the secret ingredients of the sausages he used to sell in the cover market in Oxford, and about his surprising knowledge of a famous Doctor Who actor. This is not perhaps the place to elaborate further on any of these, but we've all been invited to drinks in Vincent's later this afternoon. He had so many friends who justifiably regarded their relationship with him as special that I was wisely advised not to name them for fear of inadvertently missing some out. But an impressive number of them kindly shared their memories and impressions of Simon, many of them repeatable in church. At school, he already displayed many characteristic qualities. He was a fine all-round sportsman, sportsman, was widely popular, and did enough work to win a place at Selwyn College, Cambridge. He also managed to smuggle into the school bus for the varsity rugby match a case of gin, as a result of which the warden was obliged to write several stern letters and school trips to the varsity match were discontinued. At Cambridge, he read history in theory and even obtained a 2-2, but he's most remembered for his culinary prowess, sporting achievements and generally uproarious behaviour. In the programme for the 1985 varsity match, hockey match, he claimed, with some justification, to be studying domestic science, a subject no more on the official curriculum then than now. <laughs> this was repeated by the Daily Telegraph in its report on the match, which described his performance of the light blues as the greatest act of daylight robbery ever seen on a hockey pitch. <laughs> Oxford were clear favourites, and true to form, had 23 shots on goal, all of them saved by Simon. Cambridge had three and scored from two. Two years later, he was again in goal for the varsity hockey match but this time for the dark blues. Once again, he failed to concede a goal. He may have claimed that they were the only two clean sheets he ever managed, 
but it seems unlikely. <laughs> He's also remembered for his driving. On one occasion, he upended his car on a bowling green, an incident that caused him some concern as he was transporting a salmon moose at the time. <laughs> on another, he misinterpreted an instruction to turn left at a Ford and headed downstream to the point where the vehicle had to be abandoned. He was a leading light, as well as the chef, of a remarkable group of friends sent us on St John's College, who have remained unusually close ever since and produced a memorable tribute at his 60th birthday party. Their splendid efforts to brighten his declining days and the efforts of a host of other old friends greatly moved him. On leaving school, he'd worked briefly for Raymond Blanc, and after Cambridge, he went back to further improve his culinary skills. One day, a dispute arose between Raymond and another apprentice who went on to become a celebrated chef in his own right. It was decided to settle it by arm wrestling. Simon gallantly offered to stand in for Raymond and was soundly beaten. Despite this, Raymond maintains Simon was one of the two most talented cooks he ever taught, and he regretted Simon's decision to take up a career in teaching instead. Simon obtained his teaching certificate and his second hockey blue at Christchurch, and in 1987 accepted a post at Bryanston School. He remained there for six years, becoming head of history and master in charge of hockey. He seems to have carried on in much the same vein as he had at university, introducing pupils and staff to new levels of culinary excellence, leading the way in all sorts of mayhem and merriment, and once again making a number of lifelong friends among both pupils and staff. One colleague believed that by the time Simon left, he'd had more impact on the school than anyone else he could remember. After a period selling speciality sausages and then managing the restaurants and hotel at Watson, Simon in January 2009 joined the development office at Christchurch with responsibility for alumni relations. His boss told me it was the best appointment he ever made. Simon's qualities were perfectly suited to the job and he quickly set a new standard for alumni engagement in the university, organizing an astonishing range of events of high quality. He was subsequently appointed deputy director, and proved remarkably good at parting old members and others from their money. The boat club in particular benefited enormously from his efforts and also the music trust. There are many wonderful tributes to him on the college website are a measure of the affection felt for him by our alumni and a fund for his memory has already raised more than £200,000 to be spent at his request on graduate scholarships in history. In 2013, Simon also started helping Vincent's with fundraising, going on to become part-time bursar in addition to his considerable workload at Christchurch. He'd been a member since his university days and he loved the club. His boss there also told me it was the best appointment he ever made. He turned around the club's finances so successfully that as well as putting them on a sound footing long term, it was possible to refurbish the premises and even set up sports scholarships. As a result of his work at Christchurch and Vincent's, he was asked to advise Hampton Court Palace on their own campaign. And then he was cut off, at the top of his game, seemingly loved by all. I can think of no one who was more consistently kind, tolerant, and forgiving, or as a more reliable, sensitive, generous, and discreet friend to those in need. He had his fair share of personal crosses to bear, but it always appeared more concerned for others than himself. His first boss at Christchurch summed him up perfectly. It seemed to me that what drove Simon was making other people happy. He was very good at it.